Before I start today's video, I would like to thank Julia Montanari for suggesting and supplying me with most of the information for today's case. Julia is an Italian freelance writer who publishes fascinating and quite unknown true stories in English. It'd be really great if you could check out some of them on her webpage. You won't be disappointed. I have put a link below the description. Today we are looking at a case from the mid 20th century. So sit back as we go to Italy. Montu Beccaria is a small village in the Lombardy region of Italy, just 30 miles south of the regional capital Milan. Life in the village was peaceful, some would say uneventful, and for centuries most of its inhabitants had worked on the land. Italy, however, was changing. The years following the Second World War had been difficult, but in 1958 the country started a long period of economic growth. Traditionally, life had been centred on its rural communities, but in the 60s it began to transform into a nation of global industrial power. This meant that Italian society changed. People started to migrate to the cities to find work and take advantage of the better employment opportunities. Life in Montu Beccaria, however, had not changed very much. Some of the younger generation had left, preferring to live in the larger urban areas rather than stay working on the farms of their parents. But for some families, such as the Scabinis, everything was much the same. Giuseppe Scabini looked after the family farm. He had seen many changes in his country over the years. He had served in the army during the Second World War and married a local girl called Linda Caroni. Together they had a daughter named Ivana. His brother, named Alberto, had married his wife's sister, Carina, and they had a son called Carlo and a daughter named Anna Maria. Tragedy had struck the family four years earlier when Carlo's wife named Fiorenza died shortly after their wedding in 1963. Alberto's son, Carlo, was one of the younger generation who had left the village. He had gone to Milan and opened a wine bar. Although people had more disposable income than in previous years, establishing a business in the city was not easy. Alberto had invested in his son's venture and had tried to help him out as much as he could, but he himself had not been very successful. He had his own business selling wooden poles and trellises, mainly used for grapevines, but his income had been declining and by the summer of 1967, his financial situation was in a very bad way. He had accumulated large debts and was finding it very difficult to pay them. June 18, 1967, had been a hot day. It was a Sunday, so Giuseppe did not work. Instead, he went to church and ate with his extended family. He usually walked the fields, but his wife Linda always made sure he didn't do anything on the farm. He worked long hours during the week and needed some time to relax. In the evening, he went to the village square with his cousin named Hermano. They sat outside a bar and talked. They often did this on Sundays. The evening was very pleasant and the sun did not go down until very late. It would be the longest day of the year in three days time. Giuseppe offered Armano some chocolates. He had been given them by someone but could not remember who. His cousin declined but Giuseppe ate one. Soon after, he started to feel very unwell. He told his cousin that he had a terrible pain in his stomach. He then started to vomit. And Manno was extremely concerned. Only a few minutes earlier, the two men had been enjoying a glass of wine in the early evening sunshine. And now Giuseppe was curled up, holding his stomach and finding it hard to breathe. Emano managed to get his cousin home and immediately called the doctor. It did not take long for the doctor to arrive. Linda hurried him to her husband's bedside. She had never seen him like this. He was such a strong person and rarely ever ill. Linda held his hand, and their daughter Ivana nervously looked on. The doctor, however, looked perplexed. Linda could see in his expression that this was not just a case of an upset stomach. It was far more serious. The doctor turned to her and shook his head. Ivana knelt down by her father's bed and took the other hand. Both mother and daughter were crying as the doctor closed his bag and silently moved aside. Giuseppe squeezed his wife and daughter's hands. He tried to smile, but moments later, 
he was dead. The cause of death was unknown, but it was considered to be natural causes, probably due to weakness of the heart. A week later, the Scovenna family, who lived in Milan, came to pay their respects. They were relatives and had been shocked and saddened to hear of a sudden death of Giuseppe. They had a four-year-old daughter named Milena. Ivana decided to take the little girl out into the courtyard to feed the chickens. It was easy to sense the heavy veil of sadness that hang over Linda and her daughter, but too overwhelming for a small child to understand. Ivana also needed to be outside. She had received many visitors offering their condolences. Watching Milena happily chase the hens was a welcome relief. The little girl ran around. She was full of energy and seemed to be enjoying herself. It was a hot sunny day, so Ivana gave her a drink of water. Very soon, however, Milena started to feel unwell. She complained that she felt dizzy. Thinking she had probably spent too much time in the sun, Ivana took her back inside. Shortly afterwards, she collapsed. The doctor was called and advised that she should immediately be taken to the hospital in Stradella. However, little Milena Scarvena died before her parents could get her there. It was presumed that the cause of her death was pulmonary edema, but her distraught parents would not permit the hospital to perform an autopsy. Instead, they took their daughter back to Milan to prepare her funeral. As news of the death of Milena Scovena circulated around the village, the local people started to wonder if the Scabini's farmhouse was cursed. For the next two months, Linda tried to manage the farm. She was assisted by her brother-in-law, Alberto. He was not a popular person in the village. Many people did not trust him, and he was known to be very bad with money. It was believed that he had set his own house on fire to claim the insurance money and used it to purchase an expensive motorbike. It was also alleged that he had set fire to a sawmill where he had previously worked after the owner had dismissed him, and there were rumours that he had stolen money from his parents. But he was married to Linda's sister, and following her husband's death, she was grateful for his assistance. Alberto's mother, named Anna, also liked to help. She had been on the farm for most of her life, and even though she was 80 years old, she was an energetic lady. One hot August day, she was discovered dead in a field. There was nothing suspicious about her death, and the doctor informed Linda that her heart probably just gave up after her many years of working. The residents of Montu Beccaria were close, and the community tried to help Linda and Ivana through this very difficult time. People would visit, but many did not stay long. Some feared the house was blighted by misfortune, and most visitors declined any offer of food or refreshments. On the 15th of August, Linda's friend Mariuccia, who was Giuseppe's cousin Amando's wife, visited the farmhouse with her three-year-old daughter named Simona. The day was a celebration of the Feast of Assumption, where it was customary for friends and family members to meet up. When Maruccia arrived, she saw that Ivana was talking to her close friend Josefina, a 19-year-old local girl who often came to visit. Like a good host, on a special feast day, Linda offered the visitors some treats. She had some liqueur chocolates. She had had them for a while, but was sure her guests would like them. Of course, little Simona could not have one. She was far too young for such things. But Marucha and Josepina gladly accepted. Very soon, however, both ladies became very ill, doubling up in pain. Linda was very worried. She had seen this before with her husband. She immediately called the doctor. He quickly arrived, but when he saw the patients, he said they needed urgent medical attention and arranged for them to be transported to hospital. Help arrived too late for 19-year-old Josepina, who died shortly afterwards. Doctors tried their best to save Mariucha. The young mother was in a very bad way. She spent the next 20 days in a coma, but thanks to medical staff, she eventually recovered from her ordeal. When the autopsy was performed on Josepina's body, it was discovered that the cause of her death had been poisoning from parathion, a common and extremely dangerous pesticide widely used in vineyards. The authorities now considered that four deaths in the space of two months at the same farmhouse in the small village of Montu Beccaria 
was too much of a coincidence and arranged for the exhumation of the bodies of Giuseppe, his mother Anna, and little Milena Scovena. Parathian was found in all of them. Now realising that these deaths were all a deliberate act of poisoning, the authorities and the villagers considered that Linda was the obvious suspect. Investigators started to piece together the events preceding the deaths. Witnesses told them of the day Giuseppe died. His brother Alberto had purchased Bueri chocolates at a local bar and had given some to him. The day before Anna was found dead in the field, someone had left a bag of sweets and small cakes outside the farmhouse. Linda was suspicious and wanted to throw them away, but Alberto insisted she didn't. They were probably a gift from a sympathetic neighbour following the death of her husband. Linda did, however, feed the cakes to the chickens, subsequently some of which died. As chickens occasionally died seven or eight at a time, she presumed that they had suffered from a common avian virus and had not connected the deaths with the cakes. Investigators were informed that Alberto's daughter-in-law Fiorenza suddenly died in 1963, two weeks after marrying Alberto's son Carlo. The death was recorded as a heart attack, even though at the time she was a healthy 25-year-old. Suddenly the pieces all seemed to fit together and the residents of Montu Beccaria started to think that Alberto Scabini was responsible for these terrible crimes. But no one needed much persuading in considering him guilty. He had been accused of things before, and not many people in the village liked him very much. When the police looked into his finances, they discovered that he had large debts with very little income to pay them. If his family died, he would inherit the house, the farm, and the vineyards. These were valued at over 10 million lira, certainly enough to pay off his debts and give him a comfortable lifestyle. People remembered that two years earlier, an accountant had died after eating chocolates from the same bar, the bar that Alberto spent so much time in. Alberto denied all these accusations. He claimed that they were just rumour and speculation. People were just saying these things as they didn't much care for him. But how could he inherit the farm? His father Angelo, his sister-in-law Linda and his niece Ivana were all still alive. Nevertheless, the police arrested him and charged Alberto Scabini with four counts of murder and four counts of attempted murder. The trial opened on the 10th of March 1969 in the nearby town of Pavia. Public opinion and the press seemed to be against him. He had been labelled the Borgia of Montubacaria, but Alberto pleaded not guilty. Court-appointed pathologists testified that in their opinion, the four people who had so tragically died had all been poisoned. However, Alberto's lawyers had a pathologist conduct a detailed autopsy, the results of which differed considerably from the prosecution. They claimed that the Parathian found in the bodies of the deceased was so widely used in the area that it could easily have been absorbed into the body over the years. All the evidence against Alberto Scabini was circumstantial. No one had seen him commit the crime and the motive presented by the prosecution was tenuous. On the 26th of March, 1969, the judge found him not guilty, telling the court that there was insufficient evidence to convict him. Although he was a free man, he was still viewed with scepticism by the residents of Montu Beccaria. In the morning of the 27th of February 1970, less than a year after being cleared in court, Alberto was found dead in his bedroom. A post-mortem was conducted and traces of Parathian were found in his body. Had he taken this himself, been poisoned, or was this just from the years of working in the fields? The police eventually concluded that he had taken his own life but the residents of Montu Beccaria were not convinced and wondered if someone else had been responsible for the four deaths in 1967. As they walked around the village on their daily business, they all had the slight suspicion that a murderer might be walking amongst them. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. I'd just like to thank one more time Julia Montanari for suggesting and providing me with so much information for this case. Her webpage with all her fascinating stories is below the description. And I'll be back next week for another 
brief case 